Good morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day. We are glad that you are here on this beautiful day. Uh, I know a number of folks are on the road traveling, so we wish traveling mercies to them, and, and they've, several of them said they're going to join us online, so if you're there, welcome. We're glad to have you this day. Uh, a couple of announcements today. We will resume our fellowship hour uh, this, week in, this week at uh, 6.30. So, Sydney will be sending out that Zoom invitation. Uh, a thank you for all of those who helped with Z's uh, service and uh, the meal last week. It was appreciated, and, and I want to thank everyone who helped with that. Glad to see some folks who decided to grab COVID and hold on to it good and then throw it away. Good to see everyone back in church. Are there other prayer concerns this day among God's people? Prayers for peace everywhere, absolutely. Wonderful news, wonderful news. Are there others? Well, it's not, since we're not quite into worship other than the, the, the announcements, I would have to say that for some of us tech fans who got to watch a miracle last night, uh, there, there is thanks. For some Miami fans who I know are struggling this morning, uh, may God's mercies be with you. Uh, and um, it, it was an interesting night, and uh, if we moved a little slower, it was because the preacher couldn't fall asleep last night afterwards for a little while. But fortunately, uh, Laura got us here safely. But let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God in spirit and in truth on this beautiful day. Join me in our call to worship. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, all creation shouts of your glory. The heavens and the earth speak of your power. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, words fell us when we see your handiwork. We lack the words to tell our dreams and our awe fills the air. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, you teach us how to live. Your laws are our God, and your paths bring us wisdom. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, keep us in your care as we worship praise you. Please stand as you're able and sing hymn number 333, Seek You First.
Jesus calls us to enter the joy of discipleship, the joy of following in his way. Sin clings closely, and we struggle to respond fully to Christ's invitation. Let us seek God's forgiveness so that we may know more deeply the joy God intends. Join me in our prayer of confession. God of perfect love, you continually bring forth life, transforming sadness to joy and despair to hope. And you are weak, but you are strong. Our ways are flawed, but your ways are true. We are seldom right, but you are never wrong. Forgive us, redeem us, transform us. Take away the sin that burdens us and restore us to the people you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Relentlessly, God seeks us out. With abundant grace and boundless mercy, God seeks us out. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. to be with you. Let us pass the peace to one another. I have a prayer for illumination. Gracious God, Illumine these words by your spirit, that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you have us to be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we are made flesh. The scripture readings from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust consume where thieves break in and steal, but steal, store up for yourselves treasures in earth, where, the, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of our mouths, my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that they might be acceptable in your sight. You, O oh God, who is our strength and our redeemer. In Christ, amen. If you have read my midweek musings recently, you will know that I was on fall break a few weeks ago. What you may not know is, is that a good portion of that time I was left unsupervised. Laura's break, Laura's break was a week later and the girls went to visit the mouse in Florida. Now friends, I am not good at just sitting around. I, I can only can, can binge Netflix so much. So, so I decided to start another clean out. Drawers, closets, my closet in particular. The makeup treadmill office guest bedroom hodgepodge of a place. 
kitchen cabinets. I wasn't, I got in a little trouble for that. Old trash bags were, were filled and, and items were donated to charity stores. And I did a lot of head shaking because I was wondering where we got all of this stuff. Stuff, that's the word I'm going to use for it. It wasn't the word I always used when I was cleaning out stuff, but, but we'll go with stuff since we're good church people. It seemed that our stuff multiplied like rabbits. Or maybe, and I'm convinced this might be the case, maybe we are victims of reverse break-ins where people break into our house and just leave their stuff. I didn't even attempt to go into the garage. But I swear I've never seen some of the items I found. Of course, of course, I'm not the only person with this problem. And in fact, a friend of mine going back to my college days owns a, a self-storage in Augusta. He, he called me last Sunday. I was in the parking lot of the Walmart trying to get the right stuff to fix the camera. He was on his way to lead a conference where he would be talking to folks considering entering into the, the self-storage industry. His business is always growing he tells me, regardless of the economy, the storage industry continues to grow. He says the only industry with as much continuity, in his opinion, are funeral homes, which he calls the final above-ground storage facility for us all. He tells me when I retire, I need to open one of these facilities. The storage facility, not, not the funeral home. Now, having a lot of stuff, you might think it was a generational problem, but it's not. In a recent survey by Storage Cafe, it found that 38%, 38% of Americans were self-storage users in 2021. We can't agree on much else, but 38% of us, we got stuff we need to put somewhere. Breaking it down by generation, 54% are Gen Xers and 51% are baby boomers. But old millennials, old millennials are catching up. They're already at 41% of the self-storage users. And, and it really doesn't matter how big a home you have. The, the desire for self-storage, it, it remains. Medium-sized homes, and, and they put that anywhere from 1,500 to, to 3,500 square feet. That's a big, medium-sized home. But, but they make up 42% of the people storing things. These are folks living in two, three, four-bedroom homes. Anyway, as I was cleaning out all the stuff, I couldn't help but be reminded of, of a short essay that my dad shared on a few occasions years ago, and which I shared with you on about my first or, or fifth or somewhere at the beginning Sunday here at Lafayette Presbyterian. But I think it's worth revisiting. I mean, we revisit the Christmas story every year. So if I bring a story back once every five years, I think that's probably okay. The essay is simply entitled, Stuff. Every fall, I start stirring in my stuff. There's closet stuff, drawer stuff, attic stuff, and basement stuff. I separate the good stuff from the bad stuff. And then I stuff the bad stuff anywhere the stuff is not too, cr too crowded until I decide if I need the bad stuff. When the Lord calls me home, my children will want the good stuff, but the bad stuff, stuffed wherever there is room among all the other stuff, will be stuffed in bags and taken to the dump where all the other people's stuff has been taken. Whenever we have company, they always bring bags and bags of stuff. When I visit my son, he always moves his stuff, so I'll have room for my stuff. 
My daughter-in-law clears away a drawer of her stuff, so I'll have room for my stuff. Their stuff and my stuff. It would be so much easier to use their stuff and leave my stuff at home with the rest of my stuff. This fall, this fall, I had an extra closet built so I could have a place for, for all the stuff too good to throw away and too bad to keep with my good stuff. You may not have this problem, but I spend, seem to spend a lot of time with stuff. Food stuff, cleaning stuff, medicine stuff, clothes stuff, outside stuff. Whatever would life be like if we didn't have all this stuff? Because there's the stuff that we use to make us smell better than we do, the stuff that is used to make our hair look good, stuff used to make us look younger, stuff to make us look healthier, stuff to hold us in, and stuff to fill us out. There's stuff to read, stuff to play with, stuff to entertain us, stuff to eat. We stuff ourselves with food stuff. Well, our lives are filled with stuff, good stuff, bad stuff, little stuff, big stuff, useful stuff, junky stuff, and everyone's stuff. Now, when we leave all our stuff and go to heaven, whatever happens to our stuff won't matter. We will still have the good stuff that God has prepared for us. Each time I, I, I read this, I recall today's scripture. We spend so much of our lives accumulating stuff. But in the end, in the end, that stuff really isn't yours. And your stuff certainly isn't you. And yet, despite all most of us have, and we are all very blessed, very few of us are content with the stuff we have. And looking at this text, I was reminded of something. I had to go through all my stuff to find a book from Max Lucado's Traveling Light. He comments on, on the first line of the 23rd chapter. Uh, Psalm, maybe you've heard it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Licato writes, Come with me to the most populated prison in the world. The facilities have more inmates than bunks, more prisoners than plates, more residents than resources. They come with me to the world's most oppressive prison. Just ask the inmates, they'll tell you, they are overworked and underfed. Their walls are bare and bunks are hard. No prison is so populated, no prison so oppressive, and what more, no prison so permanent. Most inmates never leave. They never escape, they never get released. They serve a life sentence in this overcrowded facility. The name of this prison, you'll see it over the entrance, rainbowed over the gate are four cast iron letters that spell out its name, W-A-N-T, want. The prison of want, you've seen her prisoners, they're in want, they want something, they want something bigger, nicer, faster, thinner, they want. Now, they don't want much, mind you. They just want one thing, one new job, one new car, one new house, one new spouse. They don't want much. They just want one. And when they have the one, they will be happy. And they are right. They'll be happy. When they have the one, they'll leave the prison. But when it happens... When the new car smell passes, the new job gets old, the new spouse has bad habits, the sizzle fades, and before you know it, another ex-con breaks parole and returns to the prison of want. Have any of you ever visited this prison? 
you have if, if like me, at times you feel better when you have more and, and worse when you have less. You may be there now if your happiness comes from something you deposit or drive or, 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 or drink or, or ingest. Envision for a moment all that stuff. And let me remind you of a biblical and a practical truth. Your stuff, it isn't yours. Ask any funeral director. Ask any grave digger. No one takes anything with them. When one of the wealthiest men in the world, you may have heard of him, John D. Rockefeller, when he died, his accountant was asked, how much did John D. leave? The accountant replied, all of it. King Solomon summed it up in Ecclesiastes 5.15, naked a man comes from his mother wo mother's womb and naked he departs. Folks, who you are has nothing to do with your money or your clothes or the car you drive. Jesus proclaimed so much in Luke 12.15, life is not defined by what you have even when you have much. Friends, God doesn't know you as the woman with the expensive shoes in her closet. And yes, I know women love shoes. Nor does God know you by the size of your big screen TVs because guys love their TVs. Instead, instead God knows your heart. The Lord doesn't measure you by the stuff you have. See, if I understand the text, God cares what's on the inside. The good stuff that makes up your heart. And if God looks at us this way, then this is also how we should judge one another. Because if you and I decide that we will define ourselves by the stuff we have, when we have a lot of stuff, we'll feel good. And we'll feel bad when we don't. Instead, what the biblical text says is to focus on the stuff available to us. The unchanging stuff. The worldview is what Jesus is saying in these stories he shares is that we should focus on, on eternal stuff. Jesus is telling the disciples then and now to be concerned with those things, those things that, that, last, that last for the long haul, to use a southern term. And that for Jesus means all the way to the kingdom of God. As a way of describing this, Jesus provides three examples of things that do not last. First, he tells his listeners to avoid things that moths can destroy. Now, in the first century, thank goodness we don't do this in this day and age, but in the first century... Wealth and power often consisted of fine, elaborate clothes. Surely we've gotten where we don't spend too much money on fine and elaborate clothes. But Jesus notes it's foolish to set the heart upon things that moths might get at and destroy. And friends, even, even with mothballs, stuff isn't safe. I know too well, a spark, a fire, and it's gone. Our friend Nikki McMillan knows that too well. She had that happen to her home in Chattanooga on Friday. It's amazing what can happen to your stuff so quickly. So Jesus tells people to avoid the things that can be eaten away. 
He also tells us, he tells us, and most of us grew up with the King James Version, and it's a proper translation when we say to to avoid those things that can rust. But, But this is one of those places, this is one of those words when the Greek word brosis, which my Presbyterian college professor, Dr. Pete Hay, would say, we don't have a real English word to match. It's about an eating away. In this portion of the scripture, Jesus is saying everything is subject to being eaten away or destroyed. Scholars also will remind us that Jesus lived in an agrarian community. And much of most people's individual wealth was tied up in farming endeavors. Folks' worth was often tied to to the grain or to the vineyards that would be gathered up and stored in great barns. But here's the thing I discovered in my cleaning some things out. Even modern-day storage bins, you know, know those ones that are supposed to protect everything? They don't always work. You, you, you have an ingenious mouse or rat or worm, or oh, they can enter into your storehouses, and they could destroy wealth overnight. The reference Jesus is making here, it's not necessarily to a a rusty lawn chair or or an old junk Pontiac Continental, but it's the way that critters, critters could get into a granary and obliterate everything, including someone's wealth. There's no dependability in possessions like that. Jesus goes on to tell people to avoid treasures which thieves can steal by breaking in. Now, I found this interesting because I never considered architecture to be an important part in a thief's dynamic. You see, one thing I learned about this week is that they were limited in the building materials They had to build homes and businesses. There was no sheetrock. I mean, how do you build a place without sheetrock? There there were no cement blocks, really. I mean, where are you going to get your foundation from? Wood, wood was highly expensive. You didn't build something completely out of wood. No stucco. I'm sure I'm not sure what stucco exactly is. But none of that was available. In Jesus' world, most of the walls of many of the houses were made of nothing stronger than baked clay. Well, what does that matter? Well, thieves, thieves didn't have to, to break down a door that could be seen from the front. They'd bring three or four big buckets of water they throw them on your back wall. Architectures and, and, and scholars tell us this is true. They get that clay a little bit loose, and they dig right on through. They just come busting on through your walls, and you'd come in the front door thinking nothing had happened, and all your treasures, all your treasures would have been gone. Today, We don't have, oh wait, we've got cyber walls that they break through, don't they, Brittany? And they take everything. Friends, there's no permanent scene of treasure that it's the mercy of a crook. So the Lord warns people about these treasures. Put simply, Jesus warns against treasures which will wear out or be eaten or eroded or contaminated or stolen. Now, I know that there are those things like these in our lives that give us pleasure. They make us happy. But we have to remember this happiness is is only temporary. (coughs) Because after a while, after a while, they, they stop satisfying us. It's October. 
It's October, so you know what that means, right? They're already starting the advertisements for turkeys. You can go ahead and order your turkey for Thanksgiving right now. Now's the time because they're going to run out of turkeys by Halloween. And I love a good Thanksgiving dinner. But after the fourth way we have found to use turkey in a meal, I'd really just like a good hamburger. That meal I was excited about, Lord, just give me a pizza. Truth is that anyone whose contentment and joy depends on things like, like I have mentioned above, they're destined to be left heavy hearted. Because any person who has their treasures tied up in material things is bound to lose them. So Jesus suggests that we find our treasures in another place. He talks about treasures that we lay up for ourselves in heaven. And he says throughout Scripture that we do this by the love and kindness in which we engage in and share. Service. Service has always been a principle of the Christian church. The early church always lovingly cared for the poor, the sick, and the distressed, those whom no one else cared for. It was the center of their life and their faith that they treasured. But it wasn't necessarily understood by those outside of the faith. There's a great story that illustrates this point. Centuries ago, <coughs> centuries ago when, when the church was still being persecuted by the Romans, a Roman legion broke into a church seeking to loot the treasures, the treasures that the, the members were always talking about. I don't know that they had formal membership back then where they had to meet with the session, but, but you get the gist. The captain found the priest and he demanded that they go and show him the treasures that they didn't see when they walked in the door. It was said that the priest, the priest pointed to the widows and the orphans who were being fed, the sick who were being nursed, the poor whose needs were being supplied, and he said, Captain, these, these are the treasures of the church. Friends, this church still has orphans and widows to feed and sick to be nursed because every community has hunger and loneliness and addiction, pain that needs to be addressed and ministered to. Now, y'all know I work in a school. And yes, sometimes, sometimes I see physical hunger. I keep a case of, of goldfish and a case of granola bars by my desk. It is not uncommon for a kid to walk in my office. They sometimes don't realize that I'm on the phone or there's another person in there. They, they haven't figured that out, but they'll walk in my office. They know they're there. They'll grab a goldfish for their snack, and they'll head on out. But just as often... Just as often I see kiddos who hunger for the experience of being loved and valued. One kid this week said to a teacher, I wish my mom loved me as much as she loves her cell phone. Friends, we need to, to feed the hungry. And so if you want to feed the hungry, Go find a place to serve. Go mentor. Read to a class. You can even be a mystery reader over Zoom. Ask if you can just show up. Show up as kids get off the bus or out of the cars and give a high fives. A few years ago, we started at the school what we call High Five Friday. Every Friday, men, dads, Big brothers, uncles, just community members, they, they show up. I have to let them in the school at 6.45 in the morning to check in. That's earlier than I really want to be friendly. I'll be honest with you, I'm not always a morning person. 
But they come in, they sign in, they, they go to the buses and the car line, and as kids get out, all they do is celebrate them. All they do is give high fives. For about 35 minutes, that's all that happens. The kids love it. One day, a bus was pulling up, and the little kid was sitting there, and she yelled at the bus driver, there's my, my dad friends. And the driver said, oh, one of those is your dad's friend. No, 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 those are my dad friends. And even though, even though, and I probably will this coming Friday, I will bemoan getting up a half hour earlier to get there. At the conclusion of our time, even some old sentimental assistant principal will have been fed. We also have the sick among us. Sometimes it's physical, but often it's emotional or spiritual. And the need for comfort and healing is real. Cards, phone calls, texts, they make a difference. Friends, you've heard it say, but it's been said before, Jesus has no hands but yours and mine to do his work. He has no feet but ours to lead communities towards the kingdom of God. No tongue but our tongue to tell the good news, which is for all. Additionally, there is something to be said about working to store treasures in heaven, exposing our very character. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverb 22.1. It says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. Friends, things can be taken away from us, but our character, our good name, it's not one of them. Jesus ends this scripture by saying, where a man's treasure is, his heart is also. Jesus is clear that the stuff we value and what we do with the stuff we have, it's a matter of the heart. We've heard it said, what profits a person if they gain the world's riches but lose their soul? This world is not the end of life. It is, as Shakespeare would say, only a stage. It's a place on our way to that promised day. Thus, and I know it's hard to do this in the world we live in, but we must never forget the prize we should focus on is not the things of this world, but how we use the things of this world, including our lives, to serve one another. As the reading I shared with you earlier said, when we leave all of our stuff and go to heaven, what happens to our stuff won't matter. We'll still have the good stuff that God has prepared for us in heaven. A truth I know, a truth I know is whether we like it or not, all of us, all of us are getting older daily. I know some folks like me, they, they, they don't show it. Why did we laugh at that? But it's true. It's true. So sometimes we can't do everything that we would, we would have liked to have done. Sometimes, because of our health, our age, our finances, we can't do what, what we would like. Once upon a time, once upon a time, I could carry a heavy load of lumber. Just pick it up, put it over my shoulder, and carry it across the Habitat for Humanity worksite. Today... I'd end up in urgent care. I'd be asking the girls to bring me packs of ice. I'd, I'd want that, that stuff called Bengay, and I would whine a lot. Maybe my life has changed so that I need to be the one bringing the, the, the snacks, handing out the water, giving encouragement, writing a check. But you see, regardless of our situation, 
I believe each of us individually and corporately working together can do things that will make a positive difference in our world. No matter what, there is always some stuff we can do that's of eternal value. In closing, in closing, I want to share three brief things from Scripture that we can all do whatever our situation to guide us on living a life of doing good stuff. First, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Give generously and cheerfully. Friends, giving is never about an amount. Instead, it's about an approach. We should approach giving and serving others with a joyful heart and and a generous spirit. I've heard too many preachers say, you need to give till it hurts. No. Scripture's clear. You need to give till it feels good. Later in Matthew's Gospel, we hear these words, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom. Friends, even more valuable than our money is what we do with our time. We need to do our best to prioritize each day around our relationship with God and then pursue righteousness in all our actions. And finally, and most importantly, we hear this, love, love your neighbor as you love yourself. This encapsulates the gospel. I probably could get up here some Sundays and simply say that. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let us pray. Sydney would be thrilled. But the idea of serving others with the same care and compassion you would want for yourself is the most important thing we can do. That's the best stuff. So if you heard nothing else from this sermon, please remember this. Take time to tell someone you love them. And then do it again and again and again. My friends, if we'll do this kind of stuff, then we will truly live a life that can make a difference. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we do believe. Oh Lord, help our unbelief. In Christ. Amen. My friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, please stand in body or spirit as we confess that which we believe together. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. With gratitude for God's faithfulness and with thanksgiving for all that we have received, let us bring our gifts to God.
Will you join me in the unison prayer of dedication? O oh God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts. Use them, even as you use us, to accomplish your purpose, Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. You may be seated. As Laura comes to lead us in our morning prayer, a couple of... Uh, announcements that I neglected, one of which being a prayer concern. Uh, David would be on me if I didn't remind folks that we have uh, the uh, committee meeting on Thursday, 6 o'clock on Zoom, so you'll be invited to that, and if you aren't on that invitation list, please be sure to see David. Part of what we'll be discussing is our fifth Sunday meal. You can tell I'm already, I didn't get much breakfast this morning. I'm already thinking about food, but that'll be at the, the end of the month, so we'll look forward to that time together. Finally, and you, you heard me mention this in the service, Nikki McMillan, who was uh, the general presbyter for our presbytery for several years before going to work for the denomination uh, in Louisville, though she works remotely out of Chattanooga. On Friday morning, she took her dog out for a walk, and when she came back, her house was engulfed in flames, and she lost a great deal. Fortunately, everyone was okay. Even the cat survived, though the cat had to get oxygen for 24 hours, but, but is doing well. As Nikki says, Costco has underwear, iPads, and wine. I'm going to be fine. Uh, and, and she also says, we are also very well insured. May it be so for all God's people someday. Or will you come lead us in prayer? Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, you speak to us from smoky mountains and from thunderous lightning. You speak to us through the sounds of whispers and the sounds of trumpets. You speak to us from the proclamations of the firmament and from the drippings of honeycomb. You speak to us and we listen, Holy God. 
So we humbly ask you once again to speak now, for we are ready. As we witness your presence in this world, we stand in awe. For your gracious, gracious acts of compassion, we are grateful. For your providential provision of needs, we say thanks. For those love, labors of love happening all around us, in which we see your spirit shining, we smile and bask in your glory. But for those places in which we see hurt, we ask you for your help. For those places in which we see unfairness, we ask for your justice. For those places in which we see pain or loss or distress, we ask for your rest restoration. For those places in which we see wrongdoings, we ask for what you see as right to begin right away. We ask for these things because we see them and we know that you see them too. We also know you see more than we can even begin to imagine. So we pray for your pervasive presence to permeate there as well. Send us out as your people to follow your commands, to show a better way, to live together in community, and to promote human flourishing in this world for everybody. Open our eyes to see what you see, and open our hearts to participate in what your spirit is already busy with. May we be bold in our discipleship as we leave here today, and may we be bold in praying together the prayer you taught us, our Father, Art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our closing hymn is number 391, Take My Life. Let us stand and sing together verses 1 through 4.
Friends, as you leave this place, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you both this day and forevermore. Friends, go knowing that you are loved, and that is indeed some good stuff. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace.